Hello and welcome to today's Focus Wales Out of Focus panel looking at building a strategy part two uh, covering digital platforms and what's new and how to make the most of them. Uh, my name is Michael Lambert. I'm one of the directors of Scotland's music convention Wide Days, uh, which normally takes place every April in Edinburgh. Uh, this year we ran our conference and showcase event completely online, uh, similarly to, to Focus Wales here. Um, and as well as, as running what the Wide Days conference, I'm also an artist manager um, and record label owner. Uh, I run a company called The Modern Way. We represent artists including Idlewild, Father Son, and some developing artists called Tom Joshua, Zoe Graham, and Shears. Um, as well as that, I also represent the Association of Independent Music in Scotland as their regional champion, um, kind of trying to help independent labels and rights holders. Um, but quite enough about me, I'm going to, um, well, I'm joined by a very illustrious panel who I would like to invite to introduce themselves, which I'm going to do alphabetically for fairness. Um, so Ali, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Gilani. I'm the uh, European artist and label rep for Bandcamp. Um, if you don't know what Bandcamp is, hopefully you will by the end of the hour, um, if I'm doing my job right. Um, and I also uh, run an independent record label called First Word Records, uh, which releases soul, hip hop, jazz and that kind of stuff, which I've been doing for uh, ever, I think 17 years, something like that. So I'm, I'm in for life. Um, uh, but yeah, today mainly I'm going to be um, hopefully letting you guys know a little bit about how Bandcamp works. Great. Bronnie? Awesome. Hi guys, um, I'm Bronnie. I'm an artist from just outside Liverpool. Um, I am half Welsh, half Scouse. Um, so we, um, I do pop punk, pop rock kind of music. Um, I'm also the ambassador for a mental health awareness organization called The Buddy Project. Um, so I'm going to be talking about social media and how I use it. Excellent. Kev? Hiya, I'm Kev from Cardiff. I'm co-founder of a company called Pierced. We're a distribution and label services company for artists and labels in Wales. And we also run a platform called AM, which is a platform for creative collectives, artists and individuals in Wales. I'm going to come to you, Bronnie, and I just wanted to kind of I suppose set the scene really. I mean, as an artist, how have the last few months been for you? Um, how, how has COVID impacted on your career um, and, and your plans? Mm -hmm. It's it's certainly been a change. Um, I mean, because around around some time, that's when we do our European tours, our festivals, and obviously that's a no go at the moment. But um, it's, it's actually been really helpful because I've had to, I've been able to sit down and do a lot of admin um, as well as songwriting, but, you know, strategically, I've been able to set up mailing lists, um, you know, properly, properly message the fans on that. Because obviously, you know, when, when it comes to social media strategy, you're choosing the platforms. So my three main social medias are Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, you know, forget about Spotify, that's a given. But um, so to promote myself using with, with Spotify, those are three main social media platforms that I use. And I find out that, you know, I've, I've toured with uh, Little Mix, um, Neck Deep, I've played in Dingy Rock, club so the fan base they all use different social medias and everyone's you know a different age group so I found out that Instagram it's kids young adults and adults that use it Twitter is more young adults and adults and then Facebook is adults as well so you know not everyone is on every single form of social media um, who are my fans. So I've been setting up mailing lists, getting everyone uh, to, you know, keep keep in touch that way as well. So I can promote all my music um, across on social media. And, you know, fans, if they don't have the notifications on, they don't see all my tweets or all my posts on Facebook or Instagram. So with mailing lists, you know, you get an instant email, everyone gets that notification. So I've been able to let everyone know when I'm doing an Instagram live stream, when I've been releasing new merch, um, you know, because obviously artists make a lot of their money via merch, you know, playing gigs. So that that's that has been good that, um, you know, I can still sell merch. Um, and 
I've been released in a lot of singles as well. So I've done two singles and a remix. Um, and you know, you, you get so you, you get loads of time just to sit and go through all your lists, market it. You know, it was, it was number three in the rock charts in seven countries around the world and then in the top 10 in other places. Um, so it's, it's been really, really good getting to be organized and go through admin properly. Wow. Definitely doesn't sound like you've had your feet up then. But <laughs> no. not been happening. You know, it sounds amazing though. So I mean, have you found it like a, a strangely positive experience to be able to kind of, you know, take charge of all these different platforms and like really make them work for you? Oh, a hundred percent. And you, you definitely get out what you put in. I've never come across someone in the industry that works hard um, doing anything they do, you know, via social media and, they don't get results i've never come across anyone like that so and it's it's a good feeling you know it's working um social media so yeah as as well i mean i would say a big thing not not in quarantine but for artists is to make sure you have leaflets that say all, all your social medias because it, it's easy to go on stage and say yo follow me on facebook it's this and by the time you've come off stage everyone's gonna forget um so i i order like 50k leaflets a year um and i hand them out at every gig even gigs i'm not playing at um and you can see you can see the age group of all right okay they follow me on facebook so i can tell that because I, i've been playing to an order an older audience or all right i've just played a pop show with um like a boy band i'm not really afraid to I've toured with metal bands and pop bands. So, you know, if, if I can grow any form of social media, I'll do it. So I can see that the younger fans will follow me on Instagram straight away. So um, just just to see all the analytics and everything, it's very, uh, like, you know, it. you can see in the algorithms on Spotify, if I've played a show to an older audience, I'll get a higher percentage of, you know, males who are over 24. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully you didn't put that flyer order in in February because uh, you'll have a ton of them sitting around your house. But have you managed to, I suppose, like apply the same kind of, <laughs> the same kind of rules to online in terms of like trying to get people to make to follow you on various different platforms and like engage with your with your different platforms. So uh, you know, mm -hmm. you mentioned the mailing list is a really good way of kind of pulling it all together. Yes. Um, and have, have you been finding that that's working for you? Oh, 100%. Um, you know, because whenever we have a, a single that's ready for pre-order, send out on the mailing list, everyone finds out. You can see the iTunes charts, you come out. We were number two in the top pre-order lists. Um, so you can see it does work. And, you know, it, it. I use MailChimp and it's free, um, free to set up. You can literally copy and paste it onto your website. So when people go on, it just says sign up. You can post links. Um, another thing that I find out with social media is they don't like you. So if you're on Twitter, if you're trying to promote, um, a Facebook video, they obviously don't want you to go off their app. So I find that if I've got a new music video out on YouTube or a song on Spotify, I always put the link in my bio and say, check out, you know, my latest music video link in bio. And then I'll see, you know, loads of, replies and responses from that and more views on the music video whereas if you put the link in and if you say it's on youtube it's on this twitter will automatically make the post do worse and people won't be seeing your material so social media can be very good but very you know yeah absolutely yeah. there's like a, a lot to wrap your head around that's for sure mm -hmm. um, Becky, I'm going to come to you. Do you want to um, just give everyone a very sort of quick introduction uh, as to kind of who you are and, and what you've been up to through lockdown? Yeah, so um, I am Becky Ayres and I'm the MD for Sound City. And we're probably best known for the festival and conference that we run every year in Liverpool um, that we've been running now. It was due to be our 13th edition this year. And now that's postponed to next year. Um, what, um, what I'm here to talk about today is that as the pandemic started and as we could see, you know, that things were going to change for some time, we were actually thinking, well, what, what is going to be the situation, you know, for us as a festival and what can we really do about it to help the artists that we are working with year round? Because 
um, every year at Sound City we have around 300 artists that perform and we work with a lot of artists through artist development and we have a label as well called Modern Sky and we thought well what can we do to help them out during this time so we actually um, created a platform called Guest House that we've been working along um, really just over the last few months since March and Guest House is basically it's a streaming platform that allows artists to um, earn money directly through the stream so we wanted to provide something where fans could watch an artist performing and then donate directly or buy merch um, without actually leaving the page where they're watching the artist and to date we've worked with I think it's around just over 200 artists now and um, we've had the people like Matt Murphy from the Wombats who played when we did an online um, version of Sound City back in May. Um, we've had um, takeovers with um, Artists Without a Label. Um, we've been working with Levi's and Scott's, the brands. And we've done some album launches as well for artists like the Lathams. And it's just been, it's been really interesting actually, just because A, artists have raised money through donations that fans have given to them through the stream and then also they've raised a lot of money through merch and you know got extra exposure as well so i know you know there's so many things going on at the moment through you know with people that are launching streaming platforms and ways for artists to be seen on live to, online which i think is fantastic and we just wanted to do something where and also artists that are on guest house get to keep 100 percent of the donations that they make so it's something that is really interesting at the moment for us as we sort of develop it and try to increase um, the way that fans engage on the platform. Amazing. So you didn't, again, like Bronnie, you didn't waste any time, did you? So you guys basically built this as a, as a kind of uh, reaction to COVID? To, to yeah, just move. really just because we thought at the time, you know, as ba being in the live business as we are, and I know, you know, obviously Michael doing the fantastic work that you do, it's, you know, up in Scotland, it's really challenging isn't it at the moment you know obviously it has been for the whole industry yeah. and so we just felt you know we've got to act quite quickly and I guess you know it was just born out of trying to create something whereby fans could enjoy the music and the performances of artists but actually you know see a value in donating and paying some money towards that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was one of the big challenges in the first sort of few months, really, of, of this was just seeing so many artists. And it was amazing to see the way that people just started immediately engaging with their fan bases and going live on whatever platform they kind of felt was best for them. But quite quickly, there was that sort of conversation around, well, are artists actually really devaluing their live show? And, you know, is it going to make it much more difficult to get people to part with money for a similar kind of thing? So it's great that that guest house exists as a kind of way to, to mitigate that and also to allow fans to invest something in the artist or to kind of uh, put something back. So can you talk us through just exactly how the kind of financial side of it works then? Is it a free to access platform and then people donate or is it a sub subscription or is it a bit of everything? Yeah, so we started it off, it's a subscription based platform. So um, it's the, the actual paid price is 4 99 a month and 50% of that goes to the artists and 58% of the that goes to us for running the running costs of guest house. Yeah. But what we, you know, as we've been really testing things as we go and what we've been doing over the last few months is actually a free, a free subscription because obviously at the moment, um, while we have, you know, we have usually two shows a week, but we feel while we build up, you know, the, num the number of um, shows that we have, the free version is the best way to go just to give the, you know, just to make the fans, Feel that they want to engage with it but then also we've been doing some ticketed shows so we did an album launch for Jamie Webster um, who's a solo artist and he had he had sold around 500 tickets to his performance on platform and he we did a deal with him where we kept, we did a ticket split but then anything that the artists raised during the show so for example we had um, the blinders who did their album launch on there as well and they made around a thousand pounds through merch um through you know and through their album sale through wow. doing this, and they kept all the money from that so it's there's a few different ways of doing it but we always anything that the artists make for their own you know through their own um donations or their merch through the stream is kept by them 
and we just make if there is any subscription or ticket money then that's where we make a bit to for the ongoing upkeep of the platform yeah so so artists can sell merch during the live show as well then yeah they do so we for artists that don't have their own merch um we create we work with towns and um who do merch and they um create like bespoke t-shirts or tote bags for the performance so we've had some bands um like when we work with artists without a label there were some of the artists there that didn't have merch so we created them for them um and you know that just is a, a limited edition t-shirt yeah. or tote bag that they can sell during the stream amazing and has the uptake been pretty good on, on that side of things and sort yeah of so i think for you know see for some artists that are lesser known it's it's more about the artists engaging with the fans you know i think it's really interesting how artists actually put across you know what they're doing and you know build up that rapport with the fans during a live stream to do that but for the artists that are a bit more well known so for example we had run rummer on who was with artists without a label who sold I think it was a you know around a hundred t-shirts or so and she's not that well known but she's got you know kind of a growing fan base and that's the sort of thing where you know if somebody is on their on really engaging with the fans and really getting um you know that rapport going then that's where they can make the most of it but i think it's just an interesting you know as we move on to onto these you know different ways of viewing performances it's just a really interesting way to look at it and really think what bronnie's been saying about the platform she's been using is really fascinating and just what you are doing to just tweak it for different ways you know the, the different platforms that is absolutely brilliant and i think um you would do really well on, on a platform like guest house it's yeah it's really interesting to hear the the sort of link with merch you know and i suppose it ties in with with mm -hmm. ali as well and, and what bandcamp do but you know bronnie mentioned um just to what extent merch is important to, to emerging artists, you know, and as a manager, I know firsthand that essentially merchandise is the thing that can keep the wheels or the, like the plates spinning, you know, because just that little bit of regular income can make, can make all the difference. So, I mean, Bronnie, have you found that as well, that people are kind of still up for buying merch through, through lockdown? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Um, so it's been really good because obviously as soon as we found out about lockdown, um, I designed a load of new t-shirts, um, and sold them and they all sold out pretty much instantly which was great um and i've also been setting up so i, I also own a jewelry slash fashion line as well so i've been going hard at that as well getting more income from that and it's great because the more money i make from that i can pay my producer um to do a load of demos for me so and that's really handy as well um so i can just send him a vocals he does a whole track and then the money I make from that, I can make more demos and then send that round to other industry people. So it is a win-win. Yeah, absolutely. Ali, can I come to you just to sort of follow up on that merchandise point? Because I think it's really interesting that it seems like sort of merch and record sales have actually held up really well, but just people are, are way more up for buying them through maybe digital platforms where they would regularly buy them directly from the band at the show. And what's been your experience with Bandcamp since, uh, since March? Um, yeah, it's been, um, it's actually been really heartening. I think it's, um, there's so much kind of, uh, understandably a lot of, uh, trouble for a lot of people at the moment in the industry and, it, and it's a hard time, um, for a lot of people, but what's been interesting to us, I mean, we, our sort of response at the beginning, so back in March of how we would try and, um, kind of continue our mission of, of helping artists and being an artist first platform. So we decided that we would, um, initially it was just a, a one day, one Friday where instead of taking our usual 10 or 15% fee, we would waive our fees for the day and all the money would go direct to the artist. Now, you know, the reason behind doing that was, I mean, A, you're like, yeah, it's a good thing to do for artists and, you know, giving them a little bit of extra money in their pocket at the moment is, is always a good thing. But really it was also about um, just getting across that concept to fans that if you want the artists that you love to carry on making the art that you love, you need to pay them. And at the moment it's harder to do that because you can't go to the show, you can't buy the merch after a, you know, after a gig and, and all those other things that we're sort of used to as part of the ecosystem for artists. So we were just really trying to kind of reinforce that point and say here's a way to directly pay them and for this day we're going to waive our fees as well and um it, it's the response was um 
pretty overwhelming. <laughs> it was um, not what we expected at all. I think um, the first day that we did, which was back in March, we did in one day 15 times what we would normally turn over on a Friday, which would ordinarily be our busiest day. Um, the second one that we did in April, it I think we did $7.1 million worth of music and merch in a, in a single day. And obviously we didn't take any money for that. And the interesting thing is that it's not then dropped off on the other days around it. We wondered like, oh, will it be that Thursday is like a wasteland and no one sells anything and Saturday's the same, but it just continues on. And, and what, like I say, what's been really positive is I think that it's actually shown that there's a community out there of, artists and fans who understand how hard it is in independent music and understand that um if we don't support those artists there won't be a scene at the end of it you know that th those artists it really and it isn't just kind of like can i afford this new synth to use on my next record it's can i pay my rent can i you know pay the tax on my car or whatever it is so um it's actually like i say that's been the really positive thing is we've seen such a kind of an understanding from fans as well as from artists and labels. Yeah. Uh, and that's great, it's really, you know, it's really positive. I think one of the interesting things about Bandcamp as well is that it isn't just a storefront, right? There is like a social element to it. Mm. Yeah, um, so we kind of, um, you know, where we started was just literally the storefront. It was a place for you to buy music direct from an artist with kind of minimum interference from, from us as the provider of that service. Um, and, Interestingly, initially, I think we kind of, you know, we had people sort of saying, oh, you know, it'd be really good if you could recommend other things. And we were like, well, why would you want that? Like that, you just want to go and buy a thing and get out. And that's, you know, and then what we discovered was that there were organically groups growing online of people recommending Bandcamp albums and recommending artists to, pe to each other. So we then sort of thought, well, actually, there is a demand out there for that. We're not forcing that on people. This is something people want. So we created fan accounts a few years ago, whereby you can create an account as a fan, which is free. Uh, anything you buy, then you have in a collection page, which you can then stream offline once you've bought it. Um, and you then also can follow other fans and they can follow you. So you get recommendations, you get a music feed, sort of like an Instagram feed, but it's with music. Uh, and again, it's not like a, you know, algorithmically decided playlist or anything like that. It's literally these are people who I'm interested in their music taste. What, not what do they like, but what did they buy this week? You know, which is a, an important clarification. And then, you know, you get the same from artists and labels that you've cho chosen to follow because again, you're interested in hearing about their new music. Um, and it's really interesting because you can kind of see now how, you know, when you release a new record on Bandcamp, you get notification emails that go out to all of your followers, which is mainly people who've bought from you in the past. And so you get a boost in sales and then it starts appearing in other people's collections. And then over the weekend, we send our emails out saying, you know, here's what fans you follow have been buying. And then you get another bump in sales. And then those fans have bought it. And then it appears in the next set of emails the next week. And you just have this kind of um, spiral of people finding your music. And it's sort of, you know, um, much I don't really like the term that much, but it's kind of the equivalent of going viral within the social network of Bandcamp. Yeah. Um, and like I say, the, the key thing is, it's not just people who like music, it's people who are willing to pay for music, which is a really, it's a different set of fans to your kind of general fans who sort of might like your music, might stream something, you know, might, might choose to share it, but you know, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, paying for it. Um, so yeah, that set of fans is, is really important, I think, particularly as you grow, you know. I think it's really interesting as well that, you know, and it ties in with what Bronnie was saying at the start around sort of building mailing lists and almost taking that kind of old, more old school approach and applying it to digital platforms. And when you combine that with your social media, you can have amazing engagement and really connect with your audience. Um, and I, I write in saying that with Bandcamp, you can then also download your mailing list and import that to your MailChimp and, and, and keep kind of engaging throughout. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, so basically when someone buys something, they get the option to opt in to follow you and to be added to your mailing list. Um, right. And, uh, and yeah, and if, if they're added to your mailing list, yeah, that data is yours. It's not ours. You can take that data out and, uh, and use it to remarket to your fans. And um, I mean, yeah, on my own label, I do. So like every Christmas now, we've sort of got into this tradition of doing a, a free compilation on Bandcamp, which will be sort of mix of like the best of the year and a few things that are coming up. And every year that's like 
you know, a few hundred people boosted onto our mailing list because we, we, we give it for free, but we ask for a, an email in return. Um, and it's a really good way. Again, I've seen artists do it where they'll give away one track in exchange for an email. And it then means that when they come to release their album, they've got this existing mailing yeah. list that they can tap into, which is really effective. I think the other really interesting thing that I found through the Bandcamp Friday, so I manage Bank of Father Son, who um, they've had merch stores, various places and different merch deals and whatever. And we had like a whole load of merch sort of kicking around that, you know, had been gathering dust in the rehearsal room. And so that when they could finally get back into the space, they were like, why aren't we just putting this online and, you know, giving it, making sure the fans can actually can get it. And, you know, old t-shirts from previous tours and that kind of thing. And because of Bandcamp Fridays, they said, well, why, do, why don't we like dust off our old Bandcamp account that we set up in 2010, 11. Yeah. And when we logged in, we realized there was this album of uh, like old demos, uh, tracks that, you know, have never seen the light of day mm -hmm. from 2010, 11, 12, that was sitting there unlisted. And the band thought, oh, why don't we also make that available for a day? And I mm -hmm. was completely overwhelmed and surprised by the number of people buying digital. Um, yeah. And yeah. not only buying digital, but being willing to pay more than you were asking for. So with Bandcamp, there was that option to pay more than, than the kind of yeah. the minimum price. And I, I was blown up, blown away. Yeah, there, there's, so we have an option, like you say, you know, where uh, you set the price as the, as the artist, uh, and then you can tick a box which allows fans to pay more than the minimum if they want. Across the site and including on the Bandcamp Fridays that we've been running, because we now run those no revenue days on the first Friday of every month. We're running those through at least till the end of this year and possibly beyond, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, across the site, people pay more than the minimum 40% of the time, which is wow. amazing. It's like, you know, not only, I mean, this is music they could go and listen to for free. They probably have a subscription to another service where they can listen to that music as much as they want. And not only have they decided to buy it, they've decided to pay more than you even asked for it, which is, which is great. It's such a positive thing. Um, and you'll see, like, if you look on the front page at bandcamp.com, we have like a live sales feed, which just shows you what people are buying in real time. And uh, it shows the price. And if it, if it highlights in green, it means that they paid more than the minimum. And you can see it in real time how that, how that goes. Um, That's incredible. Because, yeah, if you go on that page on the Fridays, um, it'll actually start slowing down your computer because it moves so quick, the ticker, it like, uh, like the fan starts going on my computer and like internally we're all told like, stop looking at that page if you're not actually doing anything. Like just, you know, leave that it alone. That's a good problem to have. Um, and I suppose it ties in, Becky, with what you were saying there around the donations and fans being willing to buy, you know, to buy merch beyond over and above their subscription on Guesthouse. Um, and I think it's been amazing to see, you know, big high profile shows like the Laura Marlin gig, the Bitty Clyro broadcast recently. But do you think that it is viable and achievable for art, for more developing artists to, you know, to, to do kind of high quality live streams and also make some money from it? Yeah, definitely. Because I think we've seen, you know, with the, with the technology that people have available to them, um, you know, most people, have a phone and phone cameras are often you know really really good now so we've had artists for example there's an artist called molly green who we've um who has done a couple of shows on guest house because because she did a really 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 good engaging show and she as well as performing she did things like she made a scrunchie and she juggled with some eggs and it was just things that you know be, we're just a, a bit, little bit out of the ordinary, you know, to the people that were watching. And so people really loved it. And she, you know, she's not that well known, but she just really thought about her performance and she'd filmed it. She'd got um, someone, you know, that she lived with to actually just film it with her, but she did it all, you know, just on a shoestring basically. So I think it's, it's definitely, a total, you know, I think what, Bandcamp doing, you know, what Ali's just said is, is absolutely amazing. And I think just sit hearing about, like you say, it's different. The people that want to pay for music are different to, you know, ge general music fans, because it's specifically people that want to do that. But I think when you have got people that are a fan of an artist, it's about, you know, if the artist can actually just, you know, really, really find a way to, you know, speak to the fans that is just, you know, a little bit different or just not even different but it's just in in t in keeping with their own character um i think that is what works really it's just about 
thinking about you know talking to your fans as people because at the end of the day all marketing tools are just a way to communicate aren't they yeah absolutely. that's the way that you know it has to be done really great kev i'm going to come to you we've been uh, you've been sat patiently patiently listening um but i'd really like to get the perspective of of yourself from a sort of distribution you know label rights holder uh an artist perspective and how have things fared and have you seen any labels or artists doing anything quite kind of interesting or, or different through through lockdown and kind of as a result of, of the times um well i mean if i guess conventional distribution is what pierce does but i think it's important just to point out after listening to everyone and agreeing and getting excited about what what i heard is the from the label services side which means we talk a lot with labels about their campaigns and help maybe timeline and come up with ideas about promo etc etc it touches on everything that's been said here in terms of those things i think are all important to build in as almost a sum of parts to try and get as much reach as possible for the music that eventually you know maybe does only go out on their own site or on a site like Bandcamp or also then go out to conventional DSPs as well if you like and hopefully physically in the shops as well in some cases. Um, in terms of catalogue coming through Pierce labels obviously when when this all kicked off like all of us there was a an air of caution and how are we going to deal with this and some releases have been shelved or, or certainly pushed back and thankfully by now there's a bit more talk about scheduling those back in particularly album campaigns i think just because people have struggled with the concept like we've all been discussing of, of not being able to promote and all that comes with that when you do live shows you know and i think you know what Becky's doing with Guest House is a really exciting option and lots of conversations I'm having with labels and artists are around is there something like that we can use to build in we would conventionally build in or work on a campaign with a label or artist that would include touring or a show to launch the album or whatever and having options like that to start looking at I think is really exciting and important and I hope that those kind of ideas get built into almost some kind of hybrid model that gets taken on beyond the pandemic as we come out of this and that there is an element of all these ideas in a kind of digital landscape still exist but obviously the live shows merch can ex coexist with it and I hope that would just give everyone a bigger slice of the cake then and be able to do more of what everyone wants to do i mean i can't agree more with everyone that the most important thing is that artists should and if they can lead and almost interpret anything in their own creative way because ultimately they are where it all begins and ends uh, and if they can then take something like Ronnie was talking about Twitter or Facebook and interpret it herself from her point of view as an artist or creatively come at it from a different angle. It just has so much bigger effect than the likes of Pierced or Labels or anyone else pushing on their behalf and then being silent. And not everyone's comfortable with it, but I think that's why it's important that you interpret it and be honest with how you as an artist creatively want to come across and you can do that even on your own website if you don't want to be on social media. You know, I think, I think that's really important. And from a peer's point of view over this period, similarly to what Ali was saying at Bandcamp, we've seen revenues increase as a result of particularly the months of March and April when I would imagine more people were dipping in and out of their music collections wherever they are listening to that certainly probably catalog listenings we had a few sort of catalog releases that came through there was obviously more space for them to be promoted but obviously but there was also a lot of excitement with people you know sat at home being able to dip into memories talk about it 
on social media, share the tunes, you know, and uh, those things have been an interesting insight in terms of, you know, if we're not all screaming all the time on social media, then sometimes there can be space to enjoy, you know, looking back. We've all seen various Twitter listening parties as well. And I think it's nice to see those things. And I'm hoping that that kind of approach continues beyond this as a way of communicating and joining dots between these different platforms that we're all kind of representing today. I think that for me is the most exciting thing, not, well, it should be exclusively there. I think being able to maybe start something off on Bandcamp first and then follow it up across all DSPs or maybe do something exclusively at Guesthouse to launch your Bandcamp release, which then follows into, and now it's on Spotify and Apple Music and Deezer and whatever else. I just think those kind of ideas and timelines are exciting. Obviously, they stretch out campaign as well and give you more bites of the cherry. So there's just so many options to approach it from. And if the artists are up for it and creative, which you know most of them certainly are in their own way, then yeah. there are options for them to interpret that and mold it to how they want it to work. You know, I think you're totally right. If you know, if there's any positive to take from a pretty chaotic time. Um, is that the rule book is kind of thrown out the window, isn't it? And artists have complete control of how they want to kind of uh, let that play out for them. And so releases don't have to coincide with the tour and they don't have to be on a 24 month cycle. Um, yeah. People can put music out kind of as and when they want. And there's been a lot of chat around like the frequency of releases and people saying that you need to be releasing, you know, singles way more frequently on DSPs and that kind of thing. I mean, do you have any view on that or have you seen anyone doing anything quite interesting through through the last few months? I mean, in terms of during lockdown, I haven't got any specific examples where anyone's approached it differently rather than, to be honest, with caution and some labels are keen to get stuff out just because they want to keep or, or reignite momentum. Yeah. We certainly have the experience here in Wales with some Welsh language and non-Welsh language bands of release it almost releasing five or six so songs you know individually which make up an album which then across something like spotify then do show you know a large following or, or figures of listening that represent their local fan base which is obviously a different perspective from if you've managed to land a playlist and the snowball effect that that tends to have you know so you can kind of definitely have a specific um, separation between looking at a root fan base and looking at someone who's had success on the back of playlist. And then, I mean, both are valid, but they're both different approaches on how you then follow on that, you know, success or fan base and build on it. Then, you yeah. know, one is obviously entrenched in building on it within Spotify for artists and not along that platform and what you're doing within your page and the other is carrying on trying to engage with your fan base and build from there, which obviously, unfortunately, brings us around again to if you were playing live, then it would be much easier to keep engaging that local fan base and build it out, hopefully nationally then, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I think it is really interesting. We, we, we manage a like, really new artist from Scotland called Zoe Graham, who actually was due to be playing at Sound City this year, um, and she was like midway through an EP campaign, which was, was planned to be just a completely digital release. And then because live was just, you know, had, had vanished and we had planned to, we'd planned to lose some money on her touring for the rest of the year and into next year, because she was just zipping around playing lots of, lots of shows that we also decided to do a physical, a limited edition physical, uh, release of her EP, which is now available on Bandcamp. Uh, so there's like a nice, Nice theme here, but uh, where I'm getting to with it is that for her, because we were midway through a campaign, it was like a little bit, it was a bit strange really, you know, that feeling of like, okay, everything's blo sort of disappeared. All the live shows that we were sort of tagging everything around have, have gone, like, what are we gonna do? And her, her reaction to it was not to pull back from releasing music, but was actually to kind of do something different. So she ended up, she'd been working on this collaboration with a bedroom producer in Glasgow, which, didn't, doesn't really fit with her EPs, musically quite different. And she just sort of thought, well, 
now is the time to put that, something like that out. So we did and did a lockdown video and there were like lots of interest and fun kind of social media things that she did around it. And I've seen quite a lot of artists doing similar things. Uh, Bronnie, you mentioned um, when we spoke before that you've also been releasing music through lockdown. I mean, have you been doing anything kind of differently to, to how your plans were originally looking or were you just sort of following the same path and just kept, kept going anyway? We're kind of following the same path, really. Um, we're very into growing Spotify and getting our stats up, getting our followers up, because um, that's very important, obviously. Um, so that, that's been great. We've been doing that, you know, normally, consistently. But um, we've been having fun doing music videos, actually. So we did, uh, I released a single called Where I Want To Be. And uh, we've just released a music video to it. And um, it was just a load of fans holding up signs up, you know, with something that makes them happy. So that was fun. Everyone got to be involved. And then obviously you get everyone who submitted their videos. They want to watch the music video. So it's instant, you know, guaranteed views, isn't it? Um, and we normally do music videos with um, Matt from Clearway Media. But obviously, you know, quarantine, we can't. So I did... Um, a music video to my recent single called Are You The Same? Just set up a green screen, um, you know, kind of acted out like a load of different characters. And that was really fun. Um, and that was totally free. Literally just had to buy the green screen. So it's definitely made me think, you know, I used to, because I've also done loads of music videos in the past um, by myself. So it, it's made me think that, you know, I, I can still do that. I don't have to have, you know, like, I don't have to fork out loads on music videos um, for each one. Amazing. And yeah. you, know, you mentioned that sort of growing, growing Spotify and growing on DSPs is, is really important to you. Um, and I was going to ask Kev this as well. I'll, I'll sort of throw it to both of you. Um, I mean, are there, are there any things that you've been doing yourself, Bronnie, or anything that you've seen, Kev, where um, artists are using the sort of digital platforms in interesting ways, whether it be through, you know, building their own playlists or using their fan pick on Spotify or even releasing remixes and acoustic versions, alternative versions? Any things like that that you've seen people kind of really lean into during lockdown and, and beyond to, um, to grow their audience on, on the DSPs? Uh, I've certainly seen, well, those things you mentioned, really, I've seen a, a good, good few series of remixes of maybe artists that you usually wouldn't see remixes coming from, and that's been exciting, and that engages that fan base because they're not kind of expecting it. So that's been... And I think artists and labels, you know, have found more time to work into their Spotify and kind of get it, get those, that profile up to date that they've always intended on doing and adding playlists that maybe influenced their album or the album that's coming and just started sharing that on social. So, you know, start spreading the word and maybe using it as a teaser towards releases. So I've certainly mm -hmm. seen more activity you know, beyond just getting tunes out on those DSPs and actually thinking about how it looks and how it works and can I plug anything extra in it, you know? Yeah, I think that's it. There's like, there are so many tools at our fingertips, but when life was running as normal and everyone was on the road or was really busy in the studio or whatever it may be, that it's easy to let those things slip away. And I think, you know, Bronnie, you mentioned it right at the start of the panel that it's been the last few months have given a, an amazing opportunity to kind of deal with all of those things and get to grips with them and stuff. So have you found as well like on your profiles, you've been using them maybe more than you would have done before? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, when before quarantine, I made sure that, you know, every Monday say I had a full day doing admin, but when you have a whole week, and you know months to do it you, you realize there's more things to constantly update and I mean like you were saying about the remixes and acoustic tracks I've always you know known that on Spotify you get monthly listeners so that can change obviously every month so you constantly want to keep building so I released a single last in 2019 so last January and then in the M March about six weeks later, we did an acoustic version. And then six weeks later, did another single, then an acoustic version six weeks later. So we found that, you know, doing, you're not giving away all your songs. You're just doing a different version of them, really. And the fans obviously want to listen to that because they've obviously either, you know, listened to the single and loved it. Um, so then they want to listen to the acoustic version to pick out what's different. Um, so that's, that's definitely been working. And then we thought, okay, instead of doing an acoustic version, which, you know, 
fans could probably guess that we're going to do that. We thought, right, let's do a remix because we've never done that before. And um, it's great because it got put on, you know, a load of different remix playlists and uh, our monthlies kept growing. So it's been a big help. And then as well, getting fans to follow. I, I have about four or five different Spotify playlists. Um, and each, in, each, in each playlist, um, I always have, you know, one of my songs in the top five or something. So that's, you know, extra monthly listeners as well. Yeah, I think that's it. It's just almost like finding or sort of spreading your music out so that there are loads of different discovery points for people. You know, people might just listen to remix playlists and then discover you as a result of that. So I've mm-hmm. definitely seen lots of people doing that kind of thing. And, and you touched on the sort of the way that you've been using your profile. Like, do you use uh, Spotify for artists and the kind of back end tools like that to, to build your profiles? Yes, 100%. It's really, really interesting as well, seeing all the, um, all the stats of, you know, where they're listening, the age group. Um, and it is interesting. I have been noticing that Spotify stats, a lot of people listen to Spotify when they're going to work, going to college, going to school or on their way back. And obviously when it was quarantine, we we figured out that you had to, you know, push even more to get your music out there to get people to, to listen to it. Because I found that I wasn't even listening to Spotify that often. Um, you know, you, you got the whole Disney Plus, everyone was going on about that, Animal Crossing, all those, you know, hypes and as much as they would do on a normal, you know, day-to-day working basis. So, and it, it's been obviously interesting because people are going back to work. So I've seen more stats in the, in the early morning of people listening again. So it is interesting. Yeah, and I think, like, certainly as a manager, the, the first few months of lockdown, apart from rescheduling every live show that any of our acts had in the diary, which was horrific, mm. um, it was an amazing time to really dig into all these different platforms. And I think that we can be guilty to, of focusing on just Spotify and then realizing that actually, oh, there's an Apple Music for Artists uh, app. There's a Deezer Backstage app. There's, like, the, the new Amazon um, artist app. I mean, Kev, are those tools that, that, that you guys use quite a lot to kind of make sure that your artists are in the best possible position to be discovered? Yeah, I mean, we don't, as, as the distributor, we don't manage those, you know, obviously let some labels and managers manage them on behalf of artists, but on the whole, the artists do them themselves. And, you know, like, uh, like Rodney, really, they, they dig into it because of the convenience of it being an app on the phone and that you can see so many different bits of information at your fingertips it obviously makes it a bit more palatable than sort of digging into the back end of some you know clunky platform where you're trying to work out what figure is what and having snapshots of what's going on Mm. hopefully helps you know everyone along to try and work out where to target what next you know and uh, that could be anything really from maybe targeting playlists in those locations to, you know, if you are looking at targeting posts across socials in different locations to build up fan bases there. So I think it's been a good, you know, it's been an opportunity to look at all those different platforms and tools that are there. And I think anything like that can give you just an opportunity to work out this works for me. I like using that one. My fans enjoy interacting with this one. And then that is just going to help you going forward, regardless, you know, and beyond the pandemic. And I think that's what's important is that hopefully we come out of it, you know, with a slightly more polished sort of, uh, you know, where this is how we're going to approach it and, you know, use all these different platforms and join those dots to, to, to create something that reaches more people and is, you know, even more exciting. You're right. It's very much, you know, trying to figure out what works for you and then building on that, isn't it? Because I think, it, you know, one of the downsides to all the, all the platforms and all the information that's available is that it can be super overwhelming yeah. to, to be trying to keep on top of all these different data points across all your social platforms and DSPs and all that kind of thing. I mean, something that I found really useful in the last few months is a tool called Soundcharts, which essentially aggregates all your social media stats and your streaming stats. Um, and at the moment, they're for any independent artists out there, they're running a like three month trial for like a dollar a month instead of fifty dollars a month or something like that. So even if you only use it for the next little while, it could be quite a good way of just getting on top of everything. 
Um, Becky, can I come to you and sort of chat a bit more of that analytics side of things and the sort of back end of, um, of platforms? Is that is that anything that you're that you're developing with, uh, you know, on that side of things? Are you are there sort of data or analytics that artists can access around their, their streams? Yeah. So at the moment, um, we've got you know we we get all of the analytics of in terms of the number of viewers and how many people are on at any one time, and um, how much people have raised and that's something that we can send well, we, at the moment we send it to the artists after they've used it or you know the host of a show you know for example if it was artists without a label or you know a management company or something like that so yeah it's i think it's it's really important for it's always important with anything like that that artists have access to that data because then they can improve it and you know for us it's all it all comes down to that really and i think you know the reason why we've continued to develop the guest house platform is because we know that a it's been you know good for the audience reach for artists so i think at any one time the most people that have been watching a performance has been about 800 but that was you know when we did our sound city live um our live sound city um show where we had she drew the gun and um Red Bum Club who kind of got those the most streams but you know it just even for some of the artists where we've done like we did a show with Breakout West um, from Canada the uh, who do the export development there and some of their artists had about um, 50 or 60 um, people watching at any one time and that was you know just good for them being quite unknown to largely you know an, an audience that we'd driven to them so it's just yeah it's really it's really really important I think just with the back end of guest house at the moment, it's not something that our artists can access themselves, but we will move towards that. And I think just, it's just really interesting just to hear what everyone's just said about using all these different tools, because I think they are quite overwhelming sometimes, but I think when you look at it, I love the way you said, Bonnie, how you looked at your fans and, you know, them going, you know, stopping going to work and then going back to work. I think that's such an amazing, way to look at it and when you look at it like that and you see it in that way about it's just about people sort of living their lives and listening to music all of that data kind of comes to life a bit more doesn't it and it becomes a bit more interesting and tangible to be able to think about how to address it uh, yeah absolutely and I think as well your point around the numbers is really important because I think it can be easy to be focused on big numbers and needing tens to thousands of people to be engaging with something for it to be valid. And actually, if you've got 40 people watching your live stream, that's amazing. And that's potentially 40 people that will jump over to your band camp and buy a 20 quid record, you know? And yeah, so definitely. About, yeah. And I think it sounds like Bronnie, you've been doing an amazing job of, of really personalizing that through the mailing list and, and building out your audience and, and treating it in that much more personal way than just looking at big numbers and trying to sort of grow huge monthly listener numbers. Mm -hmm. and I think at the same time everyone every other artist and band are literally doing the same thing so you've got to do something different and you know get it all you know get it all down and um totally see where your fans are listening from and you know how to kind of take advantage yeah absolutely yeah. and Ali I'll come to you on, on that point as well just to sort of wrap up on the analytics because I know that there's some really in interesting information on the back end of Bandcamp but I don't know if you want to talk about that a little yeah, yeah. So, so you get, um, you know, there's basic stats in terms of listens on your page um, and also your sales. Um, you also get um, uh, what we call sources, which basically shows you where people are visiting your page from, which, again, it can be a kind of nice snapshot of like, you know, I did a Facebook promotion today. How's it working? And you'll see the, the referrals coming over. Um, there's also if you go into the plays, uh, you, you know, you can select the time frame that you've got on it. Uh, so, you know, seven days, 30 days, whatever. Um, there's a little button in the plays one called Defender. Um, and if you have a Bandcamp account and click on that, there's a little little game for you to play. So I'll, I'll let people discover that in their own time. Um, the best so, analytical tool out there. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it's been there since the beginning and not everyone finds it, but it's uh, a good way to... Um, to waste some of your lockdown time. Um, we, we also have a map so you can see where in the world your fans are. And then we introduced our app for artists uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, and within the app, you can um, 
click on, you know, it gives you a breakdown of all your sales and all of your plays. And then it, within the plays, you can tap on the button and it will give you, so if it's an album, it'll then tell you which are your strongest performing songs within that, which can be useful. Within sales, it will show you where each sale has come from. So has it come from a published notice of a new release? Has it come from a fan collection, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of, um, a lot of it is, I mean, anything I find personally just on, with my label hat on with stats is kind of tapping into what everyone else said. It, it's very overwhelming. And I think sometimes the hard thing, particularly for independent artists is, okay, so I have this information, now what? Like, what do I do with it? You know, and by the time you've figured out what it's all telling you, it's sort of too late for you to do anything about it. So I think, you know, I think with the stats thing, it's um, the, the, the sort of adage which I, it kind of feeds into Bandcamp, it's just a thing I have personally as well, is just when you're putting a release out, when you're trying to be an, an independent artist, um, there are things that you can control and there's things you can't control. And a lot of the kind of big ticket items that you see, you know, um, music industry updates about, about these large playlists and this happened here, a lot of that is out of your control as a small artist, but there is a lot that is within your control. And um, with Bandcamp, we try and focus on that stuff, stuff that you can actually do something with, you know. Um, and like, you know, I mean, we, it's a quite, I get asked quite a lot, sort of a side step from that. You know, we have people saying, oh, you know, you've got your Bandcamp editorial. If we make a release Bandcamp exclusive, will you give us coverage? And we never do that. And we never tell people to not put their music on other platforms. Like, put your music wherever your fans are going to be. It's kind of crazy not to in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, however, you can control where you send your fans to. And, you know, obviously if you send them to streaming platforms, mean, you know, and I use streaming platforms for my label and we, we make good money from them and it, it, it's a positive thing for sure. But um, I would never send fans as a first port of call to those places because if I send them to a streaming service, I get paid the minimum amount. Uh, I also don't know who they are and I don't know that they've engaged. I don't. Um, I have no way of following up with those fans. Um, whereas if I send them to Bandcamp, I, then there's a possibility that they're going to sign up to my mailing list. They're going to, you know, follow me as a fan, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of, um, you know, just kind of, uh, yeah, like I say, taking control of the stuff that you can to, to benefit you the most, you know. Absolutely. And there's also tools out there that allow you to put the decision in the fans' hands as well, aren't there? Like Smart URL yeah. or Linktree, or those kind of things where you can say, instead of pointing people just to one DSP, yeah. Point them to your smart URL and list all the DSPs and let them pick where they want to go check out the music. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, you know, we're on, you know, Linkfire and all those, you know, all the places that people use. And yeah, I think they're very useful. And the feedback I get from quite a lot of labels is that when they put Bandcamp in there with other places uh, or other sources for the music, Bandcamp gets a lot of click throughs. And maybe it's just the type of fan that's likely to click through. You know, I don't. I don't yeah. know, you'd need to kind of dig into the demographic information, but I think it's kind of a, yeah, it's a fan, it's a kind of music fans thing, isn't it? You know, you're, that's the kind of the direct place, I guess. Absolutely, and I think it ties in really neatly with what Kev was saying earlier, around artists being able to kind of control their own destiny in that way, or, or like pave the way. And, you know, so it's, I, I think that making, making sure that you cover all the bases for your audience base, which is probably going to be really broad from people that want to spend 150 quid on the, uber limited edition vinyl to someone who just wants to passively listen to a track when they're sort of chopping vegetables on a for yeah. dinner on a weeknight kind of thing so um you know i think that that kind of just using the tools that are freely available like link fire through to smart url and all of that to, to you know just make sure that your music is as widely visible as, as possible is, is a smart move um, I'm very conscious of the time and we, we've kind of only got a couple of minutes left. So I'm just going to throw it out if anyone had anything else that they wanted to sort of add before we wrap up. And if not, I'm going to ask each of you a question about just on a very personal level, what's been your kind of uh, the most sort of fun or interesting digital platform or tool that you found through lockdown? Have you, has anyone become a TikTok sensation or a, uh, does anyone sort of just realize that they're a, they're a super dweeby uh, playlister? It's, I'll maybe start with, uh, start with you, Bronny. Is there, what's been your kind of favorite platform to engage with through lockdown? Oh, that's good. Um, I, I'd say I've been, get, get, oh, I've been getting into a lot of uh, YouTube. Um, 
I used to be addicted to watching loads of band documentaries on YouTube. Um, and I've started getting into it again now that I have the time. So, and it's definitely inspiring because I literally, I'm such a nerd when it comes to band documentaries behind the scenes. And um, it's really good because it, it's just made me, you know, seeing them in the studio, it's made me want to constantly get in my studio and write 24 seven, which I have been doing as well. So for as an inspirational uh, get creative kind of mode youtube definitely has you know everything for me so i think you're right it's been a, a, a pretty good excuse to get down a pretty deep uh, youtube rabbit hole hasn't it mm -hmm. what how about um, you becky any preferred uh, or favorite digital platforms since lockdown i think i have really got into instagram live just because um it's just so well we started um, a northern chapter of the Global Women's Network, she said so, um, just before lockdown. And it was just, it's kind of a north, basically for the north of the UK. So it started in Liverpool and Manchester. And we started to, we wanted to do some like online talks and webinars. And we just, we looked at all the platforms and we thought, and we found Instagram Live was like kind of the best one for just getting people to, immediately be able to ask questions like things not like things um it was a bit daunting sometimes just because some people that we got on board you know were, were you know found it hard to access just as i did hard, found it hard to get onto zoom today so it can be a little bit shaky at times but i just really like you know how you can just get feedback and you can get people to talk to you like in real time and you can also record and then host the panels you know, or the talks or whatever you've done after yeah. that. So that's for me, really has been good. It's great for that cross promotion thing as well, isn't it? Something yeah. like Ronnie mentioned uh, when, when we spoke is that when, you, when you're sharing a screen with someone else, then both sets of audiences have been alerted about it. So it's a great way to kind of like flag, yeah, flag your friends and peers up to other people. Um, Ali, how about you? Any, any, any preferred platforms? Uh, well, I'm contractually obliged to say Bandcamp, obviously. <laughs> um, Bandcamp for artists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I, I, um, a couple of things. One uh, has been Mixcloud Live. I think it's been really good. It's been really great to have a streaming platform that's usable by DJs and you're not going to get shut down every five minutes. Um, you know, um, as uh, I mean, yeah, I did. I got this little streaming set up behind me just out of boredom as much as anything else. And uh, yeah, I did a Facebook live stream and then got removed for playing a track on my own label, which was a surprising thing to happen. <laughs> you know, that's how it works, I guess. Um, but actually completely going the other direction, the main thing I've really done through this period is um, get back into reading. I buy a lot of books about, you know, um, well, fiction stuff, but also a lot of music biographies and books about music. And two that I've read during lockdown, which were really, I found really useful. One was called Uproot by a guy called Jace Clayton, which is about kind of how the digital age has changed music and music consumption um, from the perspective of a, a DJ who toured the world through making mixtapes and kind of being very active in the early days of like Napster and LimeWire and all that sort of stuff. And that was really interesting. And it had a lot of stuff about uh, music communities that you choose to engage with and how to be a DIY artist and um, it's really good and the second was um, Richard Russell's book um, which I'm going to forget the name of learning through hearing something like that but Richard Russell the founder of XL recordings um, his autobiography was uh, again a really good read particularly anyone who's um, interested in in the record label side of things and being an A&R like the lessons he had from that um, and working with great artists was was really fascinating. So yeah, um, actual books is my digital platform of choice. <laughs> well, great. I wasn't going to let you away with the analog book, uh, but since <laughs> it was one of them, at least was about a digital uh, a digital revolution. You you can you can have it. Thank you. Uh, and Kev, finally, how about you? Um, I am just going to go on a shameless plug, but I have actually enjoyed it. We developed a website and an app called Am. Uh, and launched it beginning of March with a view to it being a sort of slow build and development. It's a it's a app, well, based on Welsh culture and arts, and there's different sections like listen and ironically live and festivals and uh, watch. And within those, there's different there's lots of labels from Wales in there put their videos up and different different bits of content and there's theatre companies etc etc and um, 
obviously once it locked down we kind of got a um lot of those companies coming to us going we were supposed to do a live show or we were supposed to do live theater and we need somewhere to host them can we have a channel on am so that we can at least still host these events in some shape or form so that uh has, has been growing and growing through through the pandemic really and i think for a lot of people it's been certainly in wales where we could you know reach those people via via socials and via the partners on the app it's been lots of people have enjoyed being able to access different parts of the arts in wales and watch or listen or read about what's going on so that's been an exciting development and took a certainly unexpected upturn in terms of you know engagement and how it's worked and we've been on a massive kind of learning curve with it and done a lot of live gigs and live theater and live book launches for Ali and you know the likes and uh, <laughs> and uh, it's just so now we've had to sort of accelerate the tech and how we're going to develop that for the next version so you know it's a horrendous time but that is a positive for am and hopefully beyond this you know it can grow and adapt to how we're going to exist in a kind of digital and physical world in sort of unison so hopefully <laughs> so yeah it sounds amazing and you know i guess an ama a great way to kind of just open up the culture and, and make it really accessible and easy for for everyone to, to check out so i mean great work to everybody on the panel for like essentially developing brand new platforms or releasing tons of music during uh during lockdown you're all absolute heroes you definitely were not sat on your backside watching netflix that's for sure um, so we have uh, we've definitely come to run out of time and come to the end of our panel, but we just uh, or I on behalf of Focus Wales and Out of Focus would like to thank the, the speakers for taking part and uh, for uh, to everyone else for checking it out. Thanks very much. Thank you for hosting. Oh, Michael. You've Thanks. been great. Thanks, guys. Cheers, yeah, guys. thank you very much. Brilliant. Cheers.